Please welcome back our AGS chairman, Dr. Chris Tucker. All right. So uh, who enjoyed the lightning talks last night? All right. So we have three more gracious volunteers uh, who are willing to put their lives on the line uh, uh, in the, the little high wire act that this is. Um, and uh, when we're done with that, we will uh, have some parting comments. But over to our first lightning speaker, Keith Ratner. OK. So I'm Keith Ratner. I'm the a geographer and chairman of the geography department at Salem State University, a medium size public institution a little north of Boston. I slightly changed my title to losing our spatial abilities, a geography professor's worry. So I've been involved in transportation and mobility certainly most of my life. All my research has been transportation oriented. I was a planner and did transportation things for 11 years. And I ran a taxi limousine company in the mountains for a long time learning how to drive in the snow. So I started off, have you seen this? Now anybody who was here yesterday saw this. American tourist Noel Satilian became an unlikely folk hero in Iceland after he entered a typo into his GPS and drove hundreds of miles out of the way. I think I would be embarrassed. I wouldn't tell anybody I wouldn't want to be a folk hero. <laughs> Have you seen this? I've had three of these, three of these this week without, uh, excuse me, I've had three this week without maps, without headlamps, without compasses. A cell phone just isn't good enough. Kevin Jordan, New Hampshire Fish and Game. This idea that people are going into the woods without having any idea how to get out and just think their cell phone's going to solve their problems. Have you seen this? Person with the BMW who nearly drove over a cliff. Woman who drove into a lake. Person trying to go to the island of Capri and ending up in the town of Carpe. Somebody who was going to go 90 miles and ended up driving hundreds of miles before they realized they'd been in the wrong place. We're losing our spatial abilities. This idea of spatial thinking, finding your way, understanding meaning from your environment, finding meaning in shape, size, orientation, location, direction. People are sort of losing this sort of skill. And I think mobility is having something to do with this. One of my favorite things as a geography professor is this idea of mental maps. A person's point of view, perception of their area and interaction, it includes sort of your objective and subjective perceptions, it can be as large as a nation. And I think people aren't looking around them. They aren't being able to make mental maps the way they used to be able to. Spatial ability is something I'm really proud of. You know, the most efficient way to rake my lawn, to mow my to, to, excuse me, to rake my leaves, to mow my lawn, to pack a truck. Things I've worked on my whole life that I'm really proud of, my overall spatial abilities. And people seem to be losing these. In the brain, spatial abilities are found in place and grid cells. There's been studies that show if we use our spatial abilities more, we tend to increase the amount of gray matter in the hippocampi areas. People who have used their spatial abilities tend to be better at doing things spatially. And we aren't practicing these things anymore. So technology is now sort of doing much of our spatial thinking for us. It lays out a path to our destination, whether it's around the block or around the world. It tells us what we're going to find when we get there. One of my favorite quotes is, you no longer look at a map to figure out where you are. You now are at the center of the map with the world opening up around you. It's a real big change. So technology, you know, it backs up our vehicle for us. Um, or I guess, the, and if we want to um, park, it parks our vehicle for us. Pretty soon we're going to be in automated vehicles altogether. We won't even have to think about what we have to go spatially. The vehicles will make the decisions for us. So there's no question that technology being involved in mobility has improved things. We have better congestion management, safer roads, pavement management, easier route funding, safer backcountry travel. But on the other hand, I think this loss of spatial abilities, this loss of spatial thinking, cognitive mapping skills, brain development, is being unrecognized. People aren't sort of seeing that we're making these kinds of changes. And as, I, as we've seen, examples are abundant. So what do we do? Well, certainly Harvard uh, physics professor John Huth started teaching a class in primitive navigation skills. He wrote a book on the art of finding our way. It all came after he was out kayaking and some people who were near him, the fog came in, got lost, had no idea how to find their way, and ended up dying. And he just couldn't understand that people just didn't have these skills anymore. 
at Salem State, our goal is to get people out into the field and sort of teach them to look around. Whether it's a field class to go look at public transit and urban space in Boston, two and a half week field class in the southwest United States, or even a field geology class that's going to do hand mapping and going to do structural interpretation and surveying. We want people to increase their spatial abilities. We do real world projects, whether it's an impact assessment of stormwater management, um, historic Harmony Grove cemetery mapping, or we're now trying to map shipwrecks off the coast of um, Massachusetts when they're sort of said off of Gloucester or something like this, and how do we map these things. Teaching spatial abilities is really important to us. I guess the last one, this was in the Boston Globe magazine a week or so ago, somebody who went on a trip with their family and didn't use their GPS. They said it was incredibly challenging, but at the end, their kids were so excited that they'd been able to go on a trip and not have to use their GPS and be able to figure out where they went. So what might you do? Hopefully encourage the reading and the understanding and use of maps. Maps are cool. Maps are wonderful. Make sure people look at them anymore. Consider more closely this idea that people are getting reduced spatial abilities, and what should we do about it? And finally, continually being a geographer who looks at the world around them and kind of really asks, what's the why of where, or how can we understand what's around us? So my hope is to have piqued your interest and stimulated some thoughts on something that I feel is real important, and I think mobility is having a real big sort of impact on. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, great. Um, welcome everyone. I'm going to talk about the rise of smart mobility and the fall of cities. I'm uh, Georg Polzer, co-founder and chief product officer at Terralytics. And I don't have a clicker, but I, or will I have a clicker, actually? If someone brings a clicker to me, thank you. Perfect. Um, I'm going to talk about the rise of smart mobility and the fall of um, cities. Today, um, Cities are not fun, right? We are stuck in a traffic jam, wasting hours and hours commuting from home to work and back. This is a very familiar picture, especially also for the people who use the New York subway every morning and every evening, crammed um, public transport services. Um, the trains are either crammed or delayed or are just not coming. And um, when you finally arrive at work, right, um, you end up sitting in meetings, doing un sometimes uninspired work, sitting in um, offices without sunlight, and it's just not fun, right? Because then in the evening, same picture, right? Same thing. You go back, right? It's, you're, you're stuck again in traffic jam in the in the bus, and um, something's wrong, right? And, and uh, the question is, why are we doing this, right? Why are we are we um, in doing this, this thing every day, um, every week? The reason is our cities, right? And cities are, are, have developed as centers of economic opportunity, right? They provide access to economic opportunity. Cities have developed as centers of culture, have developed as centers of entertainment. Um, and really, this access to economic opportunity is the reason why we either spend fortunes on rent in the city, or why we are living in suburbs out of the city, spending again hours and hours commuting in and out of the city. And we at Terralytics, we think we as humanity, we can do better. Using large amounts of data sourced from mobile networks and cell towers, Terralytics is on a mission to inform the build-out of new mobility services that in the end frees humanity from the need to live in cities. And using our data, we can start building out new mobility services that bring us from and work and back, back home um, faster. Examples for these services are high-speed trains and Hyperloop, as we have heard, um, self-driving cars where we can have a much more enjoyable and safe commute. We'll have drones delivering your favorite taco anywhere you live, right? You don't need to drive to the taco restaurant anymore, but the taco will come to you. VR um, enabling you to hold virtual meetings and not drive to your 
to your meeting room somewhere in the city. Um, and of course, ubiquitous um, connectivity allows you to get any kind of information, any kind of video link up, um, independent of where you are. And so using these new mobility services, and of course informed by the right data, um, we think cities by 2050 will be a thing of, a pa of the past. And um, humans will have abundant cities. Nature will have taken cities back. And we will live, and you will live, in a house somewhere in beautiful nature. You just returned from a business trip with a self-flying car. And you just open a beer and watch the sunset of the mountains. And the drone is on its way to bring your favorite taco for dinner. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Will Geary. I'm a second year grad student here at Columbia uh, studying data science. And I'm excited to talk to you today about visualizing transit frequency. So for the transit rider, frequency matters. Um, it matters because high transit frequency means that your transit is coming soon. Um, it means that making connections between modes and between lines is easier. And it brings about peace of mind, because you know that if you're late to the bus stop or if something breaks down, there's another one coming soon after. Um, so in short, for the transit rider, frequency is freedom. And we care because real people's lives and livelihoods are impacted by their ability to get from A to B in their communities. So if transit frequency is so important, how do we talk about it? And the answer generally is with timetables. Um, timetables serve a specific purpose. They give you a lot of data. Um, however, they're overwhelming, unintuitive, um, and lacking geographic context. There's no sense of place in a timetable, only a sense of time. So what I'm interested in is how else can we talk about transit frequency? Um, this is an open question that people have been exploring for a long time. Here's an 1886 example of a train schedule from Paris to Lyon in France. You have the stations aligned on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. I think it's interesting, um, still kind of overwhelming and unintuitive. Um, here's an example of an early isochrone map, uh, 1882 map showing travel time by rail, um, also in France, starting from Paris. And this is exciting because now we're combining space and time onto the same map. Um, so fast forwarding to the present time, what are we doing now to talk about transit frequency? Um, one thing we're doing is installing countdown clocks. Um, here's an example in New York City on the sea line. Countdown clocks are great. They tell you when the next train is coming in a very uh, straightforward and intuitive way. And we use navigation apps to help us plan our own trips um, and to get a sense of when transit is coming near us. Navigation apps are incredible. They help you um, get from A to B. They're really good for individual trips, but they don't tell you anything about the larger transit system. Um, so with that, I'm excited to share a project that I've been working on for a while called Transit Flow. Um, the motivation behind Transit Flow is that timetables are overwhelming and lacking in geography. Uh, static transit maps give you geographic context, but don't say anything about frequency. So the vision is that if we can combine these two things, we will feel joy because we can finally get an intuitive understanding of frequency in our towns and cities. Um, it's an open source project that I developed last summer as an intern at MapZen. It enables you to generate animated transit maps around the world uh, very easily, and the goal is to elevate and democratize communication about transit frequency. So here's an example of uh, what transit flows look like in San Francisco on a particular Tuesday. Um, it uses color to differentiate between modes, so blue is bus, Green is light rail, red is subway, yellow is train, and pink is ferry. Um, and it's generated by a single uh, command that you see here. Um, you simply tell it the geographic bounding box that you're interested in, and Transit Flow will generate this animation for you. So let's say you're interested then in zooming out and looking at Bay Area transit flows on a regional level. All you would need to do is change the bounding box input, and it would generate this video for you. Um, Moving along the bottom, you see an animated uh, stacked area chart. And what that's doing is at any minute throughout the day, it's telling you how many transport vehicles are on the road or on the water, in the case of ferries, um, by mode. Um, I'll show a few more examples. Here's transit flows in Chicago. Washington, D.C.
Paris. And then in New York City, we're lucky to have access to uh, taxi trip data from the Taxi and Limousine Commission. So in this map, I've layered on um, green and yellow taxi directional flows um, as green and yellow dots on the map. Um, and I include this to show that it doesn't have to stop at transit. You can visualize any mode of transportation um, as long as you have the data for it. Um, so how does transit flow work? Uh, it uses open data and open source technology. The data comes um, from Transitland, which is an open data service sponsored by Mapsen that aggregates uh, GTFS data from around the world. GTFS is an open data schema um, created to describe transit schedules uh, born out of a partnership between Google and TriMet, which is the transit operator in Portland, Oregon. Um, how to use TransitFlow, you can use it today. It's free and open source. The code and instructions are available at this link on GitHub. Um, you can see more, many more videos generated with TransitFlow at this link on Vimeo. Um, next steps, I'm thinking about ways to make TransitFlow better. Um, a few examples include visualizing passenger flows in addition to just um, transport vehicles. Um, comparing real-time performance versus scheduled performance is exciting. Um, and then visualizing future scenarios versus current scenarios so that um, planners can more effectively communicate amongst themselves and with the public about what it is that they're planning. Um, and I would love feedback and suggestions from you all. Thank you.